strengths and skills uh, are been are been used. Um, for example, I have a picture in my office. Uh, it's a pencil artwork done by a medical student of me. You know, so those are some of the issues, and that was why I was so drawn to um, Dr. Um, Buki Owosheni who um, as a student, she said she participated in the ABH art scene by playing the clarinet with the UCH Symphonia, as well as writing um, po um, prose and poetry alongside fellow students. I've shared some of her artwork and her poetry. She holds, after MBBS, she holds a master's degree in comparative literature and criticism from Goldsmiths University of London. And her interests are in tracing the renaissance of old ideas as they become transposed onto modern life. She's also the curator of um, re, um, at reading the AWS where she produces visual media and discussions on the popular Hainman African writer series of novels. And she lives in London where she works as a business intelligence analyst with the UK National Health Service. I must mention that she's also married to an Anglican priest. So she's a Yayad, the wife of a priest. Um, and then she incorporates visualization and narratives and uses data storytelling to help create insights for population health improvement. So as we are starting a curricular revision process, we are going through revising all the curricula in the college. We are well overview for a revision led by Professor Odunayo Oluwatosu, Professor of Surgery. But we have, a, we have students on the group, we have non-teaching and teaching staff, and everyone in the college is going to be involved in this process. We want us to start to reflect. And um, we're so grateful that um, Dr. Owosheni has put together is going to run a series of six sessions and basically she's going to be looking at creativity i'll let her introduce her topics but i'd already shared quite a bit about her going down the line we're also hoping that she's going to come on formally as an adjunct staff into the biomedical communications um, center which is led by dr ebukari I think Dr. Ebokare is also on this call so that she can actively participate even from the United Kingdom on our programs here. So we're hoping that over the next couple of weeks, we will finalize and get her on board as an adjunct and international member of faculty in the biomedical communications, helping us in our communications, communicating health and other arts and so on, and also enriching our programs, not only for the students, but also for the faculty. So on behalf of the College of Medicine, I welcome you, um, Dr. Buki Owosheni, and we're delighted. And I'm going to hand over to you for the next, I know you. we said we'll have run this for one hour, Maybe you leave a little time at the end for some answers and interactive session, but let me hand over to you. I know you're going to maybe briefly introduce yourself, but we are delighted, absolutely delighted. And I believe this is going to be the start of a relationship over the years to come as you work with us as an integral part of the College of Medicine. So over to you, Dr. Buki, for wishing you. Thank you, Professor Mbadu, for that um, introduction. I'm really excited to um, be I'm delivering this talk and uh, thank you to Professor Lua Tosin as well. Uh, thank you for incorporating this as part of the curriculum review. Um, I hope you will find that some of the things that we will touch on will be very useful for the, um, the review process. Thank you to everyone who's taken out the time to join, whether you're students, colleagues um, and members of the curriculum review committee. So I'll just go through a, the talk for about maybe about 30, 40 minutes, and then I'll leave some time at the end for some questions um, and comments. So I will share the screen now. Okay, I hope I'm sharing that and everyone can see. Yes, yes, we can, we okay, can. Excellent. So this is the creative series, creativity series. If anyone has seen the video, what I've suggested is that I will go through um, 
six lectures. Um, and these six lectures will consist of 12 ideas. And all these 12 ideas are tied into just one singular method of execution. Now, when we say, we, we, we sort of, we all know what creativity means, um, well, I would imagine, but, The unified by the, the idea of bringing your whole and your entire self to bear in your life, in your career, um, in your ambition, in that, in a way where we refuse to compartmentalize ourselves and leave part of ourselves on the door, at the door. So that's what this creativity series will address in all its different forms. We're going to look at how we can bring our whole selves into medicine. Medicine is very demanding. Medicine is, is life-changing. The study of medicine is life-changing. And we tend to put everything else on hold, not realizing that there are so many other parts of ourselves that do not seem allied to medicine, but actually have a place and can belong in the study of medicine. So the first thing I just like to create a scenario and just imagine. So let's just imagine if you imagine that you are you have a job as an executive assistant to a very, very famous public figure. So let's imagine you are the executive assistant, which means this person is really famous, person is a very high profile person. You are in charge of letting them know where they stand. You have to get the newspapers at 5 a.m. You have to you know, hot off the press to summarize what's going on in the news, where they are in the news. You are in charge of summarizing their business um, their business of the day, business of the week. You are in charge of their appointments. So every day you have to give this, this feedback on this is what's happening. These are the priorities. This is what your appointments look like in the future. So let's say you're an executive assistant. Can you start to think about what you would look like, what you would have to do, what you would have to dress like, um, how you would have to comport yourself, what knowledge you would need to have in order to perform your function as an executive assistant. As I'm speaking, I'm sure some people are imagining, okay, that means, you know, I need to be really, really, um, you know, good at typing. That means I need to uh, dress, you know, very smartly. I need to have a confident and commanding um, um, presentation. But now let's look at different personalities and see if our views of being an executive assistant changes. So let's imagine you are an executive assistant too. And you can drop comments in the chat if you wish to. So you were an executive assistant to Olusha Gwambasonjo. So let's start to think about what that would mean and how, how, how you would show up on a Monday morning. So how would you present your summary? Would you, would you type it? Would, you, would he require a, um, an, auditory, an auditory feedback of the previous day's events? Does he want a typed report? Are you going to follow him you know, running around when he's going from meeting to meeting? Or do you think he will sit in one place at his desk? You know, what kind of, a, the, it makes you start to think, okay, what kind of a man is Olusha Gobasajo? What kind of presentation will I need to, to get my message across to him? So we might have a different message, a different way of, um, of presenting ourselves to him. And if it was Abiola Dosumo, would our presentation change? So you're the executive assistant, so this very high profile woman, you know, would you, would you dress differently on a Monday morning than you would if it was, um, um, Gerardo Basanjo, that was the person you're working for. So we begin to see how the client makes everything change, how nothing is actually fixed, and we end up having to keep changing our presentation in order to pass our message across. She might have a different style, a different way of hearing us. If we speak, in a, if we speak to her in the same way we spoke to Basanjo, we, we might not have the same response. Our message might not be passed across properly. But if we were executive assistant to the managing director of Fidelity Bank, Neka Onyalike, how would we comport ourselves? All of a sudden, we know that we'd be very different. We'd be, we'd be much more corporate in our expression. 
So we end up find, we find that we, we, we end up we keep having to change. So there is no uniform way of passing across information. There is no uniform standard, which I'm sure the curriculum committee is aware of. A client necessitates that we change methods. We use a wide variety of methods in order to do the most important thing, which is passing that message across. And if this was our client, <laughs> it'd be a different message as well. We would have to, we might find that instead of sitting down with a report, the way we would have neatly and, you know, neatly typed out a report for, for a managing director of a bank, we might have to follow David O to parties and try and shout the message across over the music. The key thing is that this message, whatever message it is that is required for us to get the job done, is passed across. So these four people, we would never ever in a million years consider treating them all the same. So why would we treat ourselves as exact replicas of the other? So we are all very, very, very different. Now, why does this matter? I'm going to illustrate this using an example um, from art. So we know that we form individual pieces of a collective. We know that we're all medical students or we're all doctors or we're all, we're all something all together. We're a collective, but within that collective, we're individuals. And within our individual selves, we're actually not uniform at all. We have unique ideas, we have unique interests and we have unique styles, which must all come to bear in order to have any sense of a unified life. Now, the power of a unified life is that it's a life that's not fragmented. It's a life where every single skill, every single part of you comes to bear in order to achieve objectives. A fragmented life divides your force. A fragmented life limits your effectiveness. So understanding the individuality within the collective helps us to utilize all the different parts of ourselves. Now I'm going to use an example from the life of Erabo Emokwai. Um, he was an artist, 1934, he died in, 19, um, 19, died in 1984 in an accident. Um, he, and the reason I use art, I'm going to use art a lot throughout this series, I'll use art and I'll use literature. And I mean, some people might say, oh, I'm not artistic at all. Will it relate to me? Oh, I'm not really a fan of literature. Does it relate to me? Um, and, and, it, and it does. And the reason is, the reason why we use things like art or literature to explain things like medicine, which might seem very, very far off and not aligned, is because art gives us a bit of perspective. So when we stand at the foot of uh, the Kilimanjaro, for example, we are never going to see the mountain, but a bit of distance when we step back a little bit, we're able to see more of that mountain, we're able to take it in. So art can provide a very useful way of distancing ourselves from the subject matter, enough for us to be able to look at the subject matter with a bit of objectivity. So, um, and Rabbi Mokbai was a, was a modernist, was a modernist artist, um, and he was really popular, his work was really popular in the 1960s and the 70s, and he was a very commercially successful um, artist, unlike many artists who actually, you know, the, the, the phrase of the starving artist is a very common trope, but he was not a starving artist, because even though he was a very, prof you know, professional hardcore artist with his philosophy, he understood how to become commercially successful, he understood sort of how to work. He was, he was, he was, he was spoken of as mercantile almost. He understood how to straddle the divide between a passion for art and actually putting food on the table. And he did this quite well. He's most famous for um, the, 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 the bronze head of Queen Idia uh, Festac 77. And he also created mm, like wonderful iconography, which was really, really useful in Nigeria's cultural renaissance in the 1970s. So this is some of the works that he did. It's quite popular. That's that. That's the bronze head of Inidia. This is um, this is a portrayal of um, King Esige, Oba Esige's court in 16th century with the Portuguese visitors visiting. Um, he was the son of Queen Idia, and that's Queen Amina of Zari. And those pictures were actually calendars. There were calendars for I think the civil service um, in the 70s. So, but the interesting thing, what interests me more about his work is not this commercial side, it's actually his philosophy. And his philosophy 
um, was in the 1960s and 1970s, he had this idea about, um, he was obsessed with the ideas of dualism. And what dualism means is, is looking at things that are opposites, things that people think are opposites. Um, and, and try to find relationship with these things that are opposites. Now, the reason why I'm interested in this in relation to what we're talking about, about creativity and the unified self is because there are so many parts of us that we think are opposites. So I'm a medical student, when I play the piano, so you know what, I will leave the piano at the door because you know, I'm about to go into Paul Hendricks. See, I'm going to split myself into two separate parts. The piano is the thing I do when I'm having fun and the medicine is the thing that is the chore. And the more we split and fragment ourselves, we, we uphold one as the chore and one as life, when all of it is life and all of it can be melded together um, in pleasure, if we think about, if, we, if we're able to think about it and, and move away from that idea that things are split into hard lines. And that was part of his work. That was part of his obsession. This idea that there is a connection between things. So the, the red and blue painting there, yin and yang, was painted in 1963. And yin and yang represent the oriental essences of opposites. And I mean, you look at it and you think, oh, some people would say, oh, I don't know anything about art. Oh, I'm not interested. All these things are shapes and shadows and I, I'm not really good at these things. But if we get over that position and just actually look at that picture, the red and the blue, and then we look at it and we look and try and see what this artist might be saying through this. And it's open to individual interpretation. What you decide, you know, that's your own interpretation and your own interaction with the artwork. But what I see is I see the red and I see the blue. They're very different, but they're together. And they need each other and they find expression in each other. And when that red and that blue combines, then it creates a very, very new thing. Without that combination, then it's very plain, one thing on one side and another thing on the other side. Um, the, the sculpture, Life and Death, was 1967. You know, you could look at that and start to think, what, 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 does, that, what does that mean? What does that imply? And one can say, well, there, there is, okay, like maybe let's say one side is life, one side is death, and there's that connection in between them. And we can see that they're actually almost mirror images of each other. They're reversing. So even though we think that one is opposite to the other, we begin to see that some of these things that we think are opposite are not so separate. There is a connection between these things. And of interest is the, the dialogue at the bottom. And dialogue might say, oh, I hate, I go to the museum, I hate all these stupid shapes. They just put shapes there. All these shapes don't have meaning. I don't know what all this artwork is about. But when you look at it carefully, you see that there is no box that stands on its own. So you have the white boxes, you have yellow boxes, you have black boxes, you have some a little bit orange. And then you think they're all interconnected. They're all connected to each other. And it is their connection that gives it a new shape. It is the, the interaction and the interface between them that gives it a new shape. When Professor, Professor Miguel was talking about um, the curriculum review committee as consisting of students, consisting of uh, le teachers, lecturers, consisting of you know, different, different people at different levels. You know, that, this was the painting that I thought of, that, that there, is, there is no change that can happen without that intersection, without that, without that, um, without that connection between the boxes. And it's in the intersection, it's the interface between these things that new things happen, that enrichment actually happens. Now there's a quote here, and it's by an art historian and art critic, Dili Jagadev, in the book, and he wrote an essay on Arabo Mumbai. And he wrote that within his philosophical cosmos, his work is iconic and it's multi-layered. It becomes a visual representation and a reification of the symbols and splits which have become so much a part of our lives that we hardly notice their presence, but which may in fact circumscribe our perceptive ability. Now that is a very dense paragraph. So what is he saying in plain English? So what he's saying is 
first of all, that the work is multi-layered. And if you look at this work as a metaphor for life, as a metaphor for people, as a metaphor for our own selves, we can say that, yes, we agree, it is multi-layered. It's actually very complicated. And he's presenting these symbols and he's presenting these splits, these divisions, these ideas that say, oh, actually, I'm a gamer. I can game I, once I have my, what are the games, Xbox or my Nintendo things, that's, that's what I do, you know, in my off time, I can game from 10 p.m. till 4 a.m. But that's different from what happens, you know, in the lecture theatres. And it's not. So what Dili Jagade is saying is that these splits are so much a part of our lives where we don't even notice that they are there. But the problem is that these divisions they circumscribe our perceptive ability. They prevent us from actually seeing the whole picture. They limit our horizons. They don't allow us to see beyond where we are. So when we look at yin and yang, it's red and it's blue. We can see the whole picture. We can see the intersection. We can say, oh, there might be a bit of friction where red meets blue in the middle. I can see exactly where that friction will lie. But then we can say, oh, but there's also beauty. When you look at the whole thing, there is a, there is a wholeness to it. There's a beauty to it. But if we were to split them, separate those two parts you might only look at blue and never ever ever see red and then you'd lose the connections between the two so that's basically what the critic is saying that when we split ourselves into tiny fragments we limit our ability to perceive things about our own life now what does this all have to do with creativity that is the question. So we've talked about you know, things like um, um, you know, yin, yang, here and there, it's opposite. Um, we talked about personality. You know, if, if you're dealing with different people, we, we, we present information in a different way for different people because the force of their personality necessitates that things are different. We're all unique. And all these, our uniqueness has an impact on our, on our motivation. So what does all this have to do with creativity? Well, first we can define what creativity actually is. So, so the question we can ask ourselves is what is creativity itself? Why is it so important? What has that got to do with me being a unified self? Okay, so if, I, if, I'm, a, if I'm a poet and I'm a, and I'm a medical doctor, what does that mean? Uh, you know, why, where, where does creativity play a role? What do I need to do? So for most people, this is what we think creativity is. You say, oh, I'm not creative, I can't draw, I'm not creative, creative, I don't write, I don't wear a fancy beret, you know, I don't do any of these things. But I would like to argue that we are all creative. We are all, um, we are all creatives. We all think, we all have um, ideas, and we bring new things. Um, into the world, and that's a part of creativity. So creativity, in the sense I'm using it, is that creativity looks for ideas. Creativity always looks for ideas. And it uses imagination to see possibilities. It's always looking on the horizon for something that's different. And creativity asks questions. Creativity is not certain. Creativity has, doesn't have an affinity for certainty. Creativity is always interested in how could we do things differently? Why is this um, like that? Why, why do I do what I do? And creativity, therefore, that's the first idea. So I said I've got 12 ideas in this series. So the first idea is that creativity is perception. Creativity is simply the way we see. It's how we see things and it's what we see. So why do we need creativity? We need creativity to understand personality in this context of these lectures and the curriculum review. We need creativity in order to understand personality, motivations, learning styles, and preferences. It's creativity that will make us curious. There are many things about ourselves that we, 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 we don't, maybe we don't like, or we'd like to improve, or we think are different, or we think 
maybe I'm simply a nuisance. And rather than derision, which is easy, derision is always easy, curiosity is harder. So for example, if, if I can't get out, I'm supposed to be up awake at 6.30 every morning and no matter what, I can't do it. I have to be up at seven. I, I, you know, I, I hit the alarm, the alarm off button like five times if I'm able to get up. So it's easy to berate oneself and say, oh, you're so lazy and you'd never get it right. And But curiosity will say, why? Curiosity is actually the more interesting response because it's a creative response. It asks why, and it begins to see associations. It begins to see new ideas. It begins to relate one thing with the other. It begins to relate how the amount of sleep we need. It begins to relate what we ate last night. It begins to relate what is our first task in the morning. Maybe it's an unpleasant one. Should we have a more enjoyable task in the morning? So the creativity breeds questions and the questions actually motivate us in a positive sense. And it helps us to make associations and connections. So when we talk about being creative and, and, and we say that um, people look at creativity as something that goes outward, I'm creative, so I write a poem. I'm creative, so I will find out what's the next thing we can do with this thing here or there. But my second idea is that creativity must first be turned inward. That creativity, before we can go out and write the magnificent opus number three, before we can you know, be the best neurosurgeon ever, before we can take our creativity to the world and create new, uh, and create new things, you know, carry out innovative research, before we can take the creativity out there, it must first be turned inward. So when it's turned inwards, what it helps us do is that it helps us to deal with those splits. It helps us to ask curious questions that help us look at those splits that we have. It's my belief that these splits actually weaken us and divide our abilities. They prevent us from seeing the associations within these different parts of ourselves. We find that the mind, for example, then so many, so many medical doctors and poets, so many, so many medical doctors are storytellers, magnificent storytellers, um, so many are entrepreneurs, so many are, they just like to live life quite fully, and but have sometimes come into this idea where one side is not acceptable to this practice of medicine. And my argument is that it is actually vital in the place of medicine. Because you find that the doctor who is the poet has the language to describe what they're seeing on the wards. And that language and they're using to describe is a language of compassion. And that is a language that will motivate others to care for people appropriately. The doctor who is the entrepreneur has the language of commerce. They need to bring that in. They need to unify that within themselves because they see their perceptions are very different. They notice different things. When they bring that entrepreneurial perception from within themselves and they apply it to medicine, where that interface is, is a beautiful thing. That interface now helps to, 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 to create efficiency within the workforce. That helps to bring a practical view on managing resources. That helps to streamline um, the, way, the way we do things from a financial cost perspective in medicine. So, so, so some, sometimes we think there is a waste in things and nothing, and nothing is wasted. So these splits simply limit our perceptive ability. And then that's something that we use creativity to widen our perception so that we're able to bring all these things together. Now, the one method I said, six lectures, 12 ideas and one method. And the one method that I will talk about throughout this series is simple as this, is to pay attention. And that is all one needs to do. Because creativity is not innovation. Innovation means you take the, res the results of creativity, these new ideas, and you go out and you unleash them on the earth and you create wonderful things and you know you create a product with a team and lots of people you you do things and we can see what you're doing now that's innovation but creativity creativity is more of a reflective process creativity is more of a philosophical process creativity requires thinking and it requires paying attention 
And throughout this series, that's what I'm going to be talking about, ways in which we can pay attention. Now, what does it mean to pay attention? Now, to say pay attention, we pay attention. I think we do pay attention, but it's just what we pay attention to. If I asked you to describe your best friend or your spouse or your roommate, you could probably give a very detailed response of what they like, what they don't like, what, what you must not do in their presence, what you do in their presence, what they eat, what they don't eat, what will annoy them. But if I asked about you specifically as a person, you would struggle to say much. You'd say, oh, I'm very simple. Oh, I'm, I'm quite easy. Oh, I'm not this or that. We would struggle to say quite categorically what it is we see within ourselves because we're so conditioned to pay attention to our whole environment and look at ourselves last. When we look at ourselves before going out to be creative in the world, then we're able to bring every single part of ourselves into the creative process. And we're able to bring something that's new, something that's fresh, something that's new to bear in our careers. So when you say pay attention to what? You pay attention to yourself. You pay attention to your likes, to your dislikes, to your hobbies, to your preferences, to your learning styles. And as to pay attention with a creative mind is to a mind that is perceiving. It's a mind that is looking for associations. Now, if you have never connected the study of medicine with your piano playing, and you look at them as separate, then you would never see the association between them. You would never see the association with um, I don't know, maybe a mind that is very, you might be a piano, pianist and you are very precise on the keys, very precise on the keys. You have a very good ear for discord. You probably will have a very good ear for discord in life, in everything. They say how we do one thing is how we do everything. So when we bring all these things together and look at them as one life, one self, then we begin to see these associations. And these associations that we pick up, they're actually, um, let's say cheat sheets. They're actually tricks and tips that we're going to pick up to, to learn more about ourselves in order to make things easier for ourselves. A gamer, someone who says, I, I can play the Xbox for four hours, five hours without stopping. But after two hours in class, I'm really bored. Understanding that you are one person and one self, you can actually start to look for what are the associations, what's missing, what can I create in my, in my academic life, you know, what can I create, what, what can I bring from gaming into this place, is there some sort of gamification I can do to, to, to this thing, then you begin to, you begin to bring in things that work for you, and which help you to keep from dissipating your course. You're more purposeful, you do things quicker. Um, there's just an, there's an easier way. You find, you begin to find easier ways to do things because you're working with your personality, not against. Um, so the attention as well, not just to yourself as disjointed, but to your whole self. Um, and in the next sessions, I'm going to talk about frameworks and tools that exist to support this reflective process. Now, there are lots of tools, there are lots of um, psychometric tests, there are lots of uh, methods like the Myers-Briggs suite of tools. You have tools like um, um, grading people according to, um, to the big five, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, those kinds of methods. Um, those are just, those kinds of tests are just ways of categorizing different things, categorizing ideas, categorizing the way we pay attention. And I think for a curriculum review committee, it's always useful also understanding these broad categories because the way information is passed across differs according to personality type. And it's quite useful having lots of different methods in which to pass information across based on how people learn. Other frameworks and tools are trying to find out am I a visual learner or am I an auditory learner? So with this um, presentation, for example, we have the voice, we have um, things written on the screen, we have me reading things out. Different things will appeal to different people. Some people will remember the words that were written. Some people will only remember the yin and the yang. And that photograph will encompass everything that they need to know. So understanding the different ways in which people learn and process information will help, to to help us understand how to vary our message 
in a way that will get through to more people. So, just a summary at the end. So, this is an introduction basically to creativity and the unified self. And what we've discussed is, you know, we intuitively, we looking at those four pictures of those um, people, we understood intuitively, we know that they're individuals and that we must tailor, to pass a message across to them, we know that we must tailor a message differently. So that's what we discussed. We, so, so it's for us to think about how we can tailor, you know, if, we're, if we're teachers, how do we tailor messages to different people who, who understand things differently. It's not about those four people. It's, not, it's, less, it's less to do with their IQ and more to do with their personality and how they are going to receive information. We also discussed about fragmented selves and how fragmentation keeps us from a unified sense of self, how it weakens us and keeps us from being forceful and bringing our whole self to bear um, on the world. And our two ideas was creativity, what it is in perception, we need to see. We need to just see and observe, ask questions. And first about ourselves, before we go on to ask questions about everyone else, to look at ourselves and ask questions about ourselves, turning it inward, creativity must first be turned inward. And the method throughout these series is attention. And in next week, I will talk about the framework and the tools for this paying attention, how we reflect and how we carry out this introspection. And I'll begin to talk about some of the tools that we can use and how best to pay attention. So that at, by the end of these series, we will have, um, we'll have a really good um, understanding of broad categorizations of um, student types, um, learner types, personality types, and we'll be able to apply these to ourselves as well to make things easier for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Owosheni. Um, uh, yeah, we already have some hands up and I will encourage as many of our students and um, faculty members, since we started speaking, um, a lot more people have joined. And um, I know that they're going, I would encourage us to ask as many questions as we can. Um, it's been very, very enlightened. You know, I coming from a psychiatrist background um, and also having to do a lot of um, psychology and um, um, trying to fix things together and um, moving into the, I would say many times having to deal with the vague, um, I, you know, one of the things I find I found this is just very briefly is that I suspect one of the reasons I also went to psychiatry was because I felt that um, that was um, psychiatry allows a lot of allows a lot more expression um, in of yourself of of various methodologies. Um, you know, it's a very artistic aspect of medicine. That's my perception. And but I, I'm just wondering for questions from other people. What are the um, those in this in the more in the more specific um, specialties where it's either this or uh, it, you know yes or no or things like that? I also just was thinking as you were speaking that you know a lot of the methods we use to um, assess our students. Uh, we use a lot of MCQs. Whether it's either no or yes. I mean, you either know it. You know. Um, we even the in the essays and the way we mark and do our assessments. Um, many times there are uh, we have what we expect, and if the the student doesn't put down what we are expecting, then they've scored a zero. I remember very this is actually in a secondary school. Um, I remember was, uh, somebody very close to me was in a secondary school, and um, when they got back from the long vacation the um, teacher taking them in literature, asked them to write an essay on the places they visited during the um, vacation. Where did you visit? They should write an essay on the places they visited. And this person who was very close to me did not go anywhere physically, but the young girl had done a lot of reading. She read a lot of books in the during the um the the long vacation several books so she wrote an essay 
on my journeys through the world of books. So she traveled, she wrote, and, and the um, teacher was very annoyed and said she gave her, you know, and threw it out. Because he said, I told you to write about the places you went to and you're telling me you're going on journey through a book, you know, through books. So I'm just saying that in this our system and our culture, you know, we really need to start thinking, how do we bring out the creativity which breeds innovation? I actually like the way you separated creativity from innovation, but I'll come back again. Let me ask, those are just some comments and let me, we'll take a couple of comments and then you can respond. So we have Matthew Obina Nwako who has his hand up. And um, so Matthew, you could ask, um, introduce yourself and then proceed to ask your question, please. Okay, good afternoon. And um, thanks for that wonderful presentation. I, this is my first time joining this series. I don't know um, what the background or the, the reason for this was, but um, I appreciate my joining. So my first question is that, um, I, I am going to take myself as an instance. I don't know if it's an issue, but I don't like, I'm not a reading kind. Um, so I, I got to find out that I don't really, really like reading so much, although I do. So I prefer whatever I learn, just like I've learned right now, it becomes a part of me and I continue life like we did. Are you recording? Um, I want us to, yes. So I want to know, is there any need to really help, um, is there any need to, to be bothered about um, this? I, I have so much passion to read. I want to read because I know the importance, the need to read. But I can tell you I've tried to read and it gets boring. And that doesn't really make me underperform in, at any capacity. So I don't know if, you have anything to say about this thank you okay thank you very much matthew are you can you just introduce yourself so we know you which of the programs are you on oh okay i i got this um link from linkedin I oh okay with, uh, okay okay i'm not a student of the college of medicine okay that's okay no problem okay okay um let me there are a couple of comments in the um the chat box um i'll just read a couple of them it says thank you dr Wosheni. that's from dr Temi Tokwe lori for a very insightful lecture then dr mudashiru salami says we are indeed individual pieces of a collective and we are different and then okay um dr uga lahi says beautiful presentation buki and then um, one says that was awesome, beautiful, wonderful. I'm just, yes. And then there's Wale Fadari says, thanks a very insightful presentation. I'm really excited to join in the rest of the series. Examples you use and the path you invite us to walk in the series will challenge many processes we take for granted. Going into the space of equity in learning. Uh, thank you and come you I so much. And then um, Dr. Dole, who is the um, chairperson of our e-learning um, committee, says we're doing a lot of e-learning now. Creativity is curiosity and intuitiveness. Um, I'm just wondering how this will come to bear as we, during the COVID-19, we had to introduce e-learning very rapidly. So a lot of our didactic sessions are now online. So, um, and then several other comments, very excellent comments. So. Um, and there's um, Foluke Olani George says, Dr. Wosheni has opened our eyes to a whole new world. I'm excited at this journey, well done. And then there's somebody on them, on Ome, food for thought, um, food for thought for the curriculum development committee. Our students will benefit from a revamp of the current curriculum that will hopefully broaden the expression of their different personality styles without stunting their individuality. Um, and so on and so forth. So those are several comments. I don't know if anyone has any other comments before we allow Dr. Owosheni to respond to some of these um, comments that have come. Um, I, I, you know, 
some of the things that I said I'd written outside is um, when students produce questions outside the box, how do we assess them? Um, and um, how, what kind of problems with innovation and what would be your suggestions to develop our creativity as we go along? I really like the one of when you said doctors um, who are poetic may learn the path of compassion and so on and so forth. But let me uh, I'll go over to you to ask you to make comments about some of the comments we've heard. Okay, uh, thank you for the questions and the comments. I think the first question by Matthew Waffle about studying, and I, I think that, that will be something with, um, with medical students as well, um, even though he's not part of the College of Medicine. There are some who will just decide that I, I don't I don't study the way other people study. And I think that's what the question is. That's what this question is really says. I've tried to read, but reading is not for me. And I think what it really means is reading the way other people read is not for me. And that is part of the introspective process is what is your way? What is the way that works for you? Because in medical school, what you do is you end up just looking at how the most successful people read. And then you just think I can just stick it on like a bandaid and copy and it will yield success at some point. So, I mean, academics is quite good because you can always, you always have your scores, which can give you some sort of indication as what is working for you and what is not. If the reading, the way others read is, is working, um, you're not doing that, but you're remembering and you're recalling the information when, you, when you're required to recall it, then that means you've cracked a system that works for you. So you go ahead with it, irrespective of what others are doing. But if you find that academically you're still struggling and yet the, the studying is not working, then reflection is required and help is required. You can always ask questions. I mean, even as like as a medical student, you will have doctors, teachers with so many different styles. They, they've been through the process. You can always ask uh, for advice, but it's about introspection, figuring out what method is it then that does work for me. It may not be the reading per se, it could be the conditions around the reading, it could be the kind of material, it could be the presentation of the material. Um, and just exploring what does work um, is, is, is really helpful. Some people may actually find that something as simple as the font. Have, if ever, have you ever picked a novel with really, really bad font? Just font that you really can't stand. So you'd think you can't read it, whereas it's just sometimes it's a presentation of the matter. Um, so, so that's something that's worth looking into. Um, one of the comments on um, by the chair of the e-learning committee, yes, creativity definitely is intuition. Intuition is such a big thing um, and when it comes to creativity, it's intuitive and it's, it's an intuition actually requires that trust in self, trust in process, trust in, in, in understanding, in, in, in being brave enough to try to understand your own self and, feel it, and realizing that understanding yourself, that you are somebody who's of worth and understanding yourself will actually have bearing and will have dividends, will pay off dividends um, in the end when you're able to understand yourself a bit better, understand what works for you in a way that you can optimize yourself. Um, there's a question of assessments. When students produce questions and answers that are outside the box, how do you assess them? And I think that's a challenge for the curriculum review committee. And Dr. Walifader, I did mention um, equity in marking, equity in assessment. I think that's also one of the important things because some of these questions are designed for a particular type of brain and it's a loss to the profession when very perfectly adequate brains who are just wired in a different way are left by the wayside because this is not this is not their natural method so starting to look at samples of these questions and have the MTQs. Well, I think those are- Thank you. Yeah, very quickly before we end, um, I, the um, immediate past um, chair and um, director of the College Medical Education Unit, Professor Akintunde Udukogbe, I think you have a quick comment or question. Over to you very quickly, Professor Udukogbe. Uh, 
Th thank you, Ma. Good afternoon, and good afternoon to the speaker. Um, well, I, I particularly am impressed by the division of creativity from um, from innovation. But first is that one of the former U.S. presidents said that victories are not gotten at bargain prices. And some, some other people have put it another way, that there's always a price to pay, big price to pay for what you do. But I think one of the problems we have is not uh, understanding that when you attempt to change, when you attempt to be, when you attempt to be creative, there is a price that you have you will pay. For example, the provost mentioned that little girl who was whose work was torn back. She was trying to be creative, or perhaps for due to various reasons. One, the teacher does not know her. The, the teacher has not um, had, had not known her with creativity. That is why she didn't examine what she did, which was a beautiful thing. And two, maybe she also has not laid the ground for that. And that comes into a lot of things that we do, that there may be that you need to convey When and before the Google, but they, from the innovation of the internet, they created a lot of things that are now outstanding. If you ask them, was it simple? Was it easy? From what I read about all of them, it wasn't. And so it must be, where especially I tell people that the dysfunction in our society calls for creative minds calls for us to be very creative in what we do because we won't get by with what people have done or what people can do easily. You have to be very creative. You have to be very much more hardworking than previously and then you get uh, you get things done. Thank you very much. It's been a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we are two minutes over. And um, we will, I, I, with, I will get permission from Dr. Wosheni for us to make the, uh, put the recording on the college YouTube channel. I will talk to her later um, and get her permission for it so that other people can benefit from this series. Um, a couple of other more questions from Dr. Uchendu um, says, thank you, Dr. Wosheni for the lovely lecture, quite insightful and a departure from the norm. Congratulations. Professor Oluwa Tosi, um, the chair of the curriculum said, nice listening to you, Buki. I remember your set. And I think that I was head of surgery at your final year. I've benefited and I believe that students have as well. And I look forward to their coming back home to teach us also. So they look, you know, I probably be out of service then. Thank you for all making it a day with us. And I know that um, Buki, we're going to ha be, have you at the same time next week, right? Yes, maybe we'll get a little, um, another little promo that we would send out so that, and I will really encourage our students to ask questions. I think we have a mixed um, grill. We have a mix, mixed um, faculty and students. And so we're really wanting, we would really like our students to comment, please, to um, speak, put up their hands. I know there's, um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a kind of, a, there will be the, the boundaries and the barriers and the gaps. But really, our students, we really want you to come on and ask questions. This session is actually mainly for you. And we are coming in as faculty also to learn as we really reflect going on ahead. So once again, um, I just want to thank you, um, Dr. Wosheni, and um, say we'll meet with a um, next week at the same time at 4, I think 4 to 5. And um, we look forward to you taking us through the 12 ideas, six sessions. I don't know what the other one is. Um, one method. Going ahead. Yes. One method. So thank you. Let's all, we can briefly um, clap. I don't know, we can clap with the, the reaction or we can turn on our, as, as we all exit, we can all put on. I know a lot of your classmates are here um, from medical school. 
to listen to you. You. So we can so we can everyone for for joining. Thank you, and um, have a nice. That's the beauty of Zoom. So we are getting our our, our alum, alum, alumni involved in our teaching. Yes, there's um, is it uh, somebody here, Doctor Onome? Huh? Okay then. So bye everyone, and see you next week. At the same time. Thank you. Thank Bucky. you for joining. Bye. Thank you, Ma. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Buki. Bye. Thank you, Ma. Bye. Have a good rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. So, Buki, bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay.